we have a great panel to discuss what is going on in Syria today. Uh, what could the United States perhaps do to ameliorate the situation? Um, we're going to, I'll introduce everybody. Everybody's going to speak for about 15 minutes. We'll open it up to Q&A after that. Uh, Will McCants, who's in the middle, is a very distinguished uh, scholar of Islam. Uh, had a, uh, was in the, worked at the State Department uh, uh, in the, in the uh, counterterrorism uh, division, uh, working on the countering violent extremism. He runs the, uh, the, the blog jihadica.com, which is uh, well known. He, he, right now, he's a fellow in the Saban Center for Middle East Policy and the director of its project on U.S. relations with the Islamic world at Brookings. Uh, Nate uh, Rosenblatt is uh, here in the glasses. Um, and he works at Keras, which is uh, David Kilcullen's shop, uh, which is doing a lot of on the ground work in Syria. Um, and Nate uh, has worked, uh, has a graduate degree from SAIS and has worked as an election observer in Iraq, amongst other things. Ube Shabander, who is an old friend of mine who I met in Iraq, is uh, somebody who's had a, worked at the Department of Defense for seven years. He worked at, as a, uh, one of the small advisory group to General Petraeus in Iraq during the surge year. Um, he's uh, worked also in Afghanistan as an advisor to the village stability operations, which is basically special forces operations in Afghanistan. Uh, right now, he's providing uh, communications, uh, political support to Syri Syrian opposition uh, in D.C. He spent uh, five months in uh, southern Turkey working with the Syrian opposition uh, just last year. And finally, Leila Hilal, who runs the Middle East Task Force here, also runs our Syria initiative, has spent a lot of time talking with the Syrian opposition, writing about uh, Syria, um, and is also somebody who's had a long career uh, working on Palestinian issues uh, for the United Nations and has a JD from Harvard Law School, amongst other things. Uh, so we're going to start with Ube. Uh, Ube, oh, thank you. Thank, you know, thank you for having me. Um, and uh, it's always good to be back here at New America. Um, I want to address um, a couple of issues first. One is the the popular narrative that has risen in the U.S. and Western media recently that the Assad regime is winning. Uh, we saw the <coughs> list live from the Washington Post wrote actually a pretty definitive article on this issue um, about a week or a couple of weeks ago. And it's really a narrative that's really seemed to catch on. So I'm going to speak a little bit more about the military dynamics and the, the counterterrorism counter aspects and you know, what, what's, what's going on today, particularly um, with the ongoing campaign in the, in the, in the, in the coast, um, which is very significant and could have some long-term repercussions to the military dynamics uh, in, in Syria and uh, with, regional, with, a, you know, with a potential regional impact. First, the notion of what does it mean um, that the Assad regime is winning or you know, what does it mean when we say the revolutionary forces on the ground are losing? Well, it's, it's important to keep in mind that at the end of the day, when we're looking at this, a, an insurgency and a popular rebellion against a, a government, against a government that you know, claims uh, legitimacy as a sovereign entity, that ultimately the burden is on the regime, on the government forces, to prove that they are winning, that they are gaining territory. Well, it's a, you know, let's, so let's look at a, some anecdotal evidence. Um, what's really been underreported is just how much damage the Assad regime's military forces and how much attrition they've taken on in the past three years. And just how incredibly dependent the Assad regime has become on foreign fighters sponsored and trained and equipped in large part by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Quds Force and Lebanese Hezbollah. And how, how the Assad regime has really prioritized, in fact in many instances taken pains to project this image that it is gaining ground, it is a juggernaut that is gaining ter territory, and in some instances, striking local ceasefires and uh, deals with uh, local communities and local rebel forces. Um, well, first of all, if you, if you look at just how much, the, how much damage the uh, military has suffered, you've really got to take into account that it no longer relies on its conventional forces. Uh, most of whom, the Syrian you know, Arab army, most of whom remain in the barracks. It is now in, in, um, entirely, almost, almost entirely reliant upon an amalgamation of national defense forces, paramilitary irregulars trained by Lebanese Hezbollah and by the Iranian Quds Force, um, augmented by 
both Lebanese Hezbollah fighters on the ground and Iraqi Shia paramilitary forces. And the reason for that is, is that it simply cannot trust the majority of its conventional forces to do what Assad wants them to, which is primarily to launch a massive indiscriminate artillery bombardment on a city or a village, wall it off, and then go, you know, and then spearhead um, a, um, an invasion and clear that area neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, so it is really, uh, really relying upon those paramilitary forces. In fact, um, I really recommend that everyone take a look at some of the reporting that Anne Bernard is, uh, is putting out there right now. She's in, she's in Homs. And uh, if you look at the pictures that, she, that, have, that, are, that are coming out of, of these areas that the regime is, is, allowing, uh, uh, is allowing journals for the first time in a really long time to go into, they're completely destroyed. I mean, if you look at the, the rebel neighborhoods that the regime supposedly has cleared, that supposedly the regime has taken control of, there's nothing there. It's, it's rubble. So it's important to keep in mind that for the Assad regime, gaining territory essentially means you've either depopulated the area or you've completely destroyed it and made it inhabitable. So for me, that is not a metric that the Assad regime is gaining territory. Um, and it, if you look at areas that the regime supposedly has under its control, for, like I always uh, use the example of Zabadani on the, uh, on the Lebanese border, uh, that rose up very early on against the Assad regime. Well, the regime still, the majority of its forces are still in a holding pattern in these cities because the regime knows that if they move a full brigade combat, you know, what's, or, or what's essentially a task force that's akin to a, to a brigade out of these areas, they will slip back into rebel, you know, uh, either in, they will become contested or the rebels or the Free Syrian Army will come back and, and take them over. So in the areas where the regime does claim control, it's really reversible in many instances. Um, and if you look at Damascus, even the central Damascus, you know, the, um, the checkpoints every few hundred meters that exist in Damascus today didn't come out as a result um, of, a, of a regime military strategy to defend Damascus against the Free Syrian Army. They came out, they were a result of a, very, of a, of a policy that the Assad regime crafted very early on in the revolution to prevent activists and protesters from converging into the city center. So even, again, even in the urban areas that the regime claims control, it is very, very tenuous and very easily reversible and is easy to imagine uh, what, would ha what would potentially happen if the Assad regime removed the saturation of security forces from these areas and uh, the potential scenario of a popular movement rising back up and the Free Syrian Army entering it because of the general ideological opposition to the Assad regime um, in large swaths of the urban areas that are still nominally under control uh, by the Assad government. And lastly, um, on the counterterrorism aspect, I just want to make a quick, um, a quick comment on that. You know, <clears throat> the New York Times uh, this week uh, wrote a very definitive and important article on, on you know, new American intelligence on what Ayman Zawahiri wants to see accomplished in Syria. And that we're seeing more and more um, Al-Qaeda operatives coming from Pakistan, coming from Al-Qaeda safe havens in South Asia to Syria. So it's important from a policy perspective to realize that there, there is a preventative rather than reactive policy that can be taken to um, address this issue. Namely, that the Free Syrian Army on January 3rd declared war against Al-Qaeda's um, factions in Syria. And then on January 7th, Amil Zawahiri issued a very detailed fatwa declaring war on the Syrian opposition coalition and elements of the Free Syrian Army that are fighting these transnational extremist groups. Um, so I'll leave that, leave that discussion further into, into the question and answer session. But I just wanted to, from a Syrian opposition perspective, really highlight that US policy has an alternative option in dealing with the counterterrorism threat and increasing its, uh, its partnership with the opposition and with the Free Syrian Army on the ground before this threat becomes too, you know, too wide and too embedded in Syria to, um, to handle in, a, in, a, in an effective uh, manner uh, in, in partnership with local forces. Thank you, Ube. Um, Will? Yeah, uh, I'll pick up where Ube left off with, uh, with the jihadis in Syria and then kind of zoom back out to look at the broader uh, complexion of the opposition, um, at least as it exists on the ground in the north and south. Um, 
as you've probably read, there was a major split among the jihadis uh, in Syria uh, a few months ago, uh, namely between the Islamic State in Iraq and Asham or Greater Syria and Al-Qaeda's branch, Nusra. Uh, the split had been a, a long time coming. They had been beefing with one another for a while. There had been even some sporadic fighting between ISIS and Nusra in places like Raqqa for months leading up to the larger split. Um, what mainly brought it about uh, was a, uh, the ISIS's refusal to submit to any sort of arbitration because ISIS considers itself a state and does not consider itself uh, just another uh, militia group um, and as such refused to submit to any sort of arbitration when there were disagreements. This also brought it into conflict with the other main uh, Salafi militia that's fighting in Syria, Ahrar al-Sham. Um, and it led to the fighting uh, that Obeid alluded to in January uh, between uh, various parts of the Islamic Front, the Free Syrian Army, uh, and Nusra going after ISIS. Uh, the way the situation looks on the ground now is that ISIS is sort of a big, inky black spot over much of Raqqa province and to the northwest, northeast of Deir Ezzur. Um, it's been pushed out for the most part uh, of the territory it held around Aleppo, uh, but the regime uh, has come in behind them and taken over a number of those areas. And this infighting uh, is incapacitating uh, the opposition's ability to effectively push back uh, in northern Syria uh, against the Assad regime. So that's, that's one dynamic that's happening. Um, uh, among the Salafi militias, there's a new push uh, into uh, Latakia, uh, and the push I don't think I, I, I don't think will last very long because logistically it's very difficult to supply because they are they are moving into uh, generally hostile territory. Um, but it is important for morale uh, to push into Assad's heartland, which is one reason they're doing it. And I think the other is that it takes some pressure off of other areas in Syria where the, the rebels are having a harder time against the regime. Um, the biggest split uh, among the rebels is, of course, between the Free Syrian Army and the Islamic Front. Um, they're willing to work uh, tactically together uh, in many areas, but there's a, there's a fundamental split between them uh, that has to do with regional political dynamics. Um, and a lot of what is keeping the, the rebels from being ineffective has to do with uh, uh, fighting between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Uh, this has affected uh, the, uh, the uh, Itilaf, the Syrian opposition coalition, um, and it has also affected the militias. The Islamic Front is much more in the Qatari camp, not solidly, but big chunks of it are, particularly Ahrar al-Sham uh, is in the Qatari camp. Um, and uh, the Free Syrian Army is much more in the Saudi camp, again, with, with caveats. Uh, but some of the main forces uh, that are part of the Free Syrian Army, like the Syrian Revolutionaries Front, that's been pushing it back against ISIS, is widely held to, uh, believed to be uh, backed by the Saudis. The Qataris have encouraged, um, I don't know how sincere they are, but they've encouraged the Islamic Front uh, to uh, subsume themselves under the Supreme Military Council, um, which is affiliated with the Free Syrian Army, uh, but the Islamic Front has refused. And again, I don't know how serious the Qataris are really, are really pushing them. Uh, and the Free Syrian Army itself uh, is fractured because of this infighting uh, between factions associated with the Saudis and factions associated with the Qataris. Uh, so you have, um, you have these very big splits uh, in the rebellion uh, that are keeping it from coalescing and, and presenting a united front against Assad. The other thing, of course, that's keeping them divided uh, is private money that's flowing into Syria. Uh, people often talk about, when they talk about Syria, they talk about states and who the states are sponsoring, which is important. I've just talked about how it's influencing the conflict. But private individuals are having an outsized impact in Syria. Uh, we usually think of this in terms of foreign fighters, and indeed there are thousands who have flooded into Syria at an al alarming rate um, that are impacting the fortunes uh, of the rebels. 
But there's also a lot of money that is coming in that are keeping these foreign fighters fed and that are also keeping some of the, the, the most conservative of the militias uh, in business. This has been a dynamic uh, that's, that's been apparent since 2012 um, and is one re big reason why the opposition, the rebel opposition, was unable to coalesce. Because on the one hand, you didn't have a systematic flow of funding and heavy weapons coming from a centralized source, so that would have been state provided, and that was absence. Absent. The uh, United States wasn't willing to do it. The Saudis and the, and, and the Qataris were fighting with one another. It was difficult to line it up, so that kept people from coming together. And then the other dynamic is this private money flowing in, particularly to the Salafi militias, if you're getting all of your money, and we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars according to U.S. intel estimates, if you're getting all of your money from private sources with no strings attached, none of the strings that the Americans want attached to it, if you're getting all your money from elsewhere, why would you come together into a larger fighting force uh, if you didn't have to? And this dynamic is still at play. A lot of this money is going through Kuwait. Uh, the government does not have good counter-terrorist finance laws. Um, they are trying under U.S. pressure uh, to shape it up, uh, but there's still a lot of money coming in. The Saudis have also tried to tighten up. Um, they have done a little bit better, uh, but there's also a recognition that for two years, uh, they've really turned a blind eye to a lot of their young men going to fight, and a lot of the uh, uh, recent measures uh, um, uh, and decrees, royal decrees that have come out, as well as the recent counter-terrorist law that came out, uh, is an effort to kind of roll this back. Um, it's been Saudi policy that they didn't want young men to go fight for a long time, but they didn't really put any muscle behind it. They're trying to, and they should. They have a lot of their youth fighting in Syria. Um, Far and away, the largest number of followers of, of the ISIS and Nusra Twitter accounts come from, from, uh, from Saudi Arabia. Um, it is going to be a big headache, and it's going to be a big headache for the rest of the Gulf. This kind of money that is flowing into Syria and these mechanisms that have been created for moving this money, um, that's not going to go away. Uh, this conflict will endure. Those methods will get more sophisticated when the conflict ends. All of those networks and that money are going to go elsewhere, and it can also fuel sectarian conflict at home. Uh, one final point is that it seems from recent press reports that Saudi and the United States are trying to uh, energize uh, the rebels that are fighting in the South um, as a way to put uh, uh, Assad under increased pressure on two fronts, but also to um, in, 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 in a way, um, uh, take some of the energy away from what's happening in the north, which is, which is so divided. The main problem there um, is the same problem that has persisted throughout the conflict is that uh, the United States does not want uh, the rebels to get serious anti-air weapons. Um, Jordan uh, is also quite resistant. And until that resistance goes away, those rebels fighting in the south uh, will not be able to regain the ground that they have lost against Assad. It will be a very difficult slog. Nate, thank you, Will. Uh, thanks, Peter. Thanks to the New America Foundation for putting this on, everyone for coming. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, the issue of Syria and the conflict from a different perspective. Um, um, at Keras, uh, we've been doing a lot of work for almost two years now understanding the dynamics of local community governance, um, aid procurement, aid delivery, and basic service provision. Um, so when we think about, when, when I think about the, the issue of Syria, when we do analysis on it, this sort of central unit of analysis is this local community governing structure around which a lot of um, a sort of events and forces sort of orbit. So the armed actors, Islamist groups, aid, uh, the international community, et cetera. So that's the sort of perspective that I want to bring here. Um, before I get into my points, I just want to note that I'm speaking in my personal capacity, uh, not as a Keras analyst. Uh, we do a lot of our work with uh, USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives, which has, I think, had the, the intestinal fortitude or the foresight to um, fund a little bit more of the learning and sense making in Syria and not just the programmatics. I think understanding the uh, nuances of Syria's conflict is as important <coughs> in acting appropriately in Syria as uh, actually just acting. And so 
I think when I, when I sort of present my remarks, I think we'll talk a little bit about three things. The first is um, seeing as we're just past the three year anniversary of the uprising, talk a little bit about how civilian governance capacity has evolved since the start of the uprising. Uh, very, very, very brief, I promise. Uh, the majority of my remarks will focus on sort of taking you across Syria, thinking about what is the sort of context of these different local dynamics. Everyone says a Syrian conflict is very local. It's hard to say anything uh, more broadly about the conflict. There's no one size fits all policy, et cetera. So I think I'd like to present some, some of the themes that we're finding in the different areas of the country. Uh, and then lastly, present a few uh, things that we see as major issues going forward and things to be looking at carefully in the, in the Syrian context. Um, so that said, I mean, I think we've been focusing on, in Syria for almost two years, the issue of uh, local councils. And when we started this in uh, uh, fall 2012, these, these local councils, which were basically community generated responses to the absence of regime authority in their area. So people were saying, you know, not only how do we provide basic services, keep schools open, pick up trash, et cetera, but also how do we build a decision-making authority that's legitimate at the local level. And so as early as mid-2011, we saw these, form, uh, these, these organizations form. And over time, they evolved. And at the point at which we were started looking at them in the fall, they were still very different. You had community organization groups that were 15 people. They represented the local families, et cetera, et cetera to 350 people elected by a community. So in Efrain, for example, in Aleppo, there's a 350 person general assembly. Other councils would work in secret. Um, so we, we, we would speak with council members who were in the suburbs of Damascus. Their job was to just help IDPs get acclimated to the community. It was regime controlled. So they worked completely wow. in secret. Um, but over time, as we got into 2013, these councils started to homogenize and I think not Coincidentally, there was a lot of international attention paid to this entity that was a local council. And so now, looking at that today, local councils are sort of a thing in Syria. Every town and city has one. Uh, they're generally about 20 to 40 people in size. They've got about 12 to 15 sort of executive leadership positions that include president, vice president, someone who focuses on human rights issues, someone who focuses on education, finance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we've seen a sort of process of homogenization of these councils. Uh, and on top of those councils now are provincial councils whose job is ostensibly to connect the local community needs up to the Syrian opposition coalition or the Etilaf. Uh, and then the programmatic agendas that the Etilaf has, the provincial councils are supposed to bring that uh, down to the local level with varying degrees of success. So that's where we are today. Um, what does this mean when it comes to understanding the local dynamics across Syria? Uh, I'll just very briefly take you through a few themes that we see when we look at the local community uh, sort of governing entity and their relationship particularly with armed groups that Ubay and Will talked about um, through the north to the east, south, and then back into the middle. Um, when we look at the dynamics in the north, particularly in Aleppo and Idlib, uh, we see two major themes arise. And the first one Will talked a lot about, and that is the ebb and flow of uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, ISIL or Daesh, as it's sort of colloquially known. Um, and so in late 2013, Daesh sort of took over a lot of towns in northern Syria. And people we talked to in councils were very worried and felt like essentially it was a Sharia law version of the regime. Control was very heavy handed. Uh, the, uh, the Daesh would establish collaborators in the community that would rat out activists who were trying to sort of work with the councils and work with local civil society groups. As Will said, Daesh has a very overt governance strategy and this was very counter to that. Um, but I think the theme that we note here is that, as Will mentioned, Daesh has been kicked out of these areas in northern Syria, particularly Aleppo and Idlib. And when we talk to councils and say, well, what do you think about that? Isn't that good that Daesh is gone? They said, yeah, it's good, but we're still in the same place where another Daesh could come and take over just as easily. Um, and so what's to say that the Islamic Front, if they, did, if they started to develop an interest in governance and not just fighting, uh, wouldn't be able to impose similar restrictions on our lives. And so I think the theme of the vulnerability of councils in these areas and their inability to really partner with <coughs> large armed groups that can provide a sponsorship and a deterrent to these Islamist groups that have an interest in not just protecting communities but also governing them. Um, the second theme I think we really note is this transition we're starting to see between armed groups getting involved more as 
as aid providers. Um, and so the Syrian Revolutionary Front, which has been sort of the representative of the Syrian Military Council and the Etilaf in the northern parts of the country, has been for a long time involved in the protection of aid deliveries. A lot of these groups will take a cut of whatever aid comes in as part of payment. Um, but the SRF and um, the Islamic Front, as we'll mention, particularly Ahrar Sham, is very powerful in these northern areas. They've also been doing a lot of aid sponsorship, but they've started to become more like aid providers. And there's a major debate within the different factions of the Islamic Front as to whether that's a, I guess you could say, a market that they're starting to get involved in. And a couple of weeks ago, Ahrar Sham in particular, which has been a proponent of this strategy, uh, to sort of organized the delivery of 10 large uh, aid trucks into southern Idlib. And the reason this is important is because um, this is a heavily conflicted area. It's a town called Khan Shekhun. And aid is, it's very hard to get aid to that area. And so what Ahrar Sham is saying is not only can we coordinate the battle strategy, but we can also start cooperating with the Khan Shekhun local council, Syrian civil society organizations, and Turkish aid organizations to provide aid in the same areas. I think that's a really significant trend. Um, going east, um, it, we'll look at Raqqa. And as we'll mention, Raqqa is sort of the headquarters of Daesh since it's been kicked out of Aleppo and Idlib. And in looking at Raqqa, I mean, it was almost a year ago that Raqqa was the first liberated provincial capital in Syria. And so many of the hopes of the opposition were poured into this place. And it was considered by many potentially to be the capital of opposition-held Syria. And the trajectory we've taken from then to now, I think, is an unmitigated disaster um, for a number of reasons. Um, but today, basically, Daesh runs the, the city. It runs, really, the province. It's replaced the local council with people who are beholden to them, not entirely replaced in terms of individuals, but the political uh, recognition of their authority. Um, and the only group that really contests their authority in Raqqa is Jabhat al-Nusra. And we can talk about that dynamic a little bit in the Q&A if you're interested. But I'm going to go keep going east to the northeast in Al-Haseke province. And this gets into Kurdish politics, which if you're interested in, we can talk a lot about. But basically, the Peyyadeh, the Syrian Kurdish representative of the PKK, really runs uh, Al-Haseke and most of Rojava, or the Syrian Kurdish areas, um, with the same sort of heavy-handedness as Daesh, just without the Sharia law uh, sticker attached to it. And people are really concerned about Peyadez's interest in governance and how that often comes into uh, conflict with a lot of the activists that are Syrian and Kurdish and working in these areas. Um, and so a lot of Syrian Kurds who are interested in reaching out to the Arab community in those areas are often um, prevented from doing so by the Peyadez. And I think the presence of the regime in these areas as well really puts a lot of tension between the Kurdish and Arab communities in that area. Going down to Deir ez -Zur, um, and I think in Deir ez -Zur it's particularly interesting. There's a major disconnect between the local needs and the provincial council that I talked about earlier, trying to reflect those needs upward, and the ability of organizations to provide aid in Deir ez -Zur. Um, And mostly that's because you know, the two major routes to Deir ez -Zur are through Turkey, down through Raqqa, and that has been blocked by Daesh, and they won't allow aid to come through. There's also a route that comes from regime-held parts of sort of rural homes um, and Palmyra and et cetera. And that goes in. So the Syrian Arab Red Crescent has been present there. Um, there's also aid routes that come in from Iraq, but those have different affiliations and allegiances when it comes to armed groups. So the Sharia Commission is very powerful there. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you're interested. But I think the point here is um, that the, it, there is a major problem that of, of the Itilaf being able to work with the communities in Deir Zur and and uh, I'm going to have to say this is a very funny quote. We talked to a guy from Deir Zur a week ago, and he was very frustrated with the provincial council, which was part of the Etilaf and making a lot of promises for aid that could be delivered to the community. And the guy said, in talking about how the Deir Zur provincial council was not making do good on its promises, they said, you know, the, the guy said, the Deir Zur provincial council has not provided even one cigarette of aid. Uh, it sort of <laughs> justify the local frustrations with, with the, the Deir ez Council. And that also manifests itself in not just cigarettes, but something important, which is water. And there's a huge water problem in Deir ez -Zur. Just to quickly go south, um, in Dera, I think, as Will noted this, there is a much better, more unified civilian and military uh, cooperation entity. And um, uh, 
think Layla's laughing at me. I mean, maybe I'm over time. But there's a much better cooperation between civilian and military groups there. The provincial council and the local council and a lot of the local armed groups, many of which have affiliations with the Syrian military council, are, are working very closely together. And you know, as, um, as Ubay mentioned with the issue of Kassab and um, the sort of opening that that lays out in terms of the inability of the regime to really extend a lot of its authority in areas that it considers priorities. So it's going after Yabrud, for example, outside Damascus, but it's having trouble reaching Kassab. Dera is actually another example of that, and it's really become op it's opened up a lot in the last few weeks. Um, as the regime fights in Yabrud, it's really opened the ability for armed groups to fight in Dera, and they've taken grain silos a couple weeks ago in Dera, uh, and, and bread is a huge problem in Dera, so that was a very important move. They're also looking to make moves to go north towards Damascus. Um, but I think the opening of Dera province, insofar as it relates to the presence or absence of the regime, has really also created an opening for other Islamist groups with more governing interests to get a foothold. And so we're seeing Jabhat al-Nusra is actually playing a, an important role in the area. And our, our teams estimate about 10% of the council positions in Dera province are of beholden to Nusra. And I think they see that growing. Um, and I, I won't go into too much more. I think in Damascus, the ceasefire issue is big, and I'm going to talk about that in the last bit. So I, I'll just leave it there. We can talk about all the other areas if you want. I'm going to just quickly say, what's ahead? Um, I would posit three things as themes to really focus on and for people who have an interest potentially to write research papers on. The first is this issue of ceasefires, and Layla is going to talk a lot about that. But I think there are two aspects of it that are very troubling. One is the increase in siege warfare that we're seeing as a tactic, both from the regime side and from the opposition side militarily to extract concessions from one another. Um, and so the regime has been besieging communities in Damascus for a long time. It's led to the ceasefires from those communities. But the opposition has done that as well. In Deir Azur, they cut off electricity to Deir Azur city in order to get the regime to give them the bodies of martyred soldiers. So I think it almost doesn't seem like it could get worse in Syria from a civilian perspective. But I think this is a very troubling trend that could indicate that it might. Um, in addition to that, I think the ceasefires in Damascus have fallen apart and um, in most places. And I think in large part that's due to the lack of enforcement of anyone in um, holding both sides to an agreement. So for example, in Yarmouk, which is the Palestinian camp in Damascus, um, there was uh, a ceasefire that was brokered by the local community with the regime. They needed aid. And aid came in. But all of the requirements or all the things that the regime agreed to do or not do were broken by the regime. And so Jabhat al-Nusra stepped into the community and said, we're going to defend you against all these violations the regime has done. And so then the regime in turn said, well, the ceasefire is now, khalas, it's over, and we're breaking it off. And so the community is really frustrated with this. But the thing that's important to note is, I think, when thinking about negotiated outcomes in Syria, cease the, 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 um, the enforcement of these agreements is just as important, if not more so, than the agreements themselves. Um, and lastly, I think two points. This issue of armed groups becoming aid actors, I think, will become a major issue, not just in the particular areas, but other parts of Syria, um, especially as we think about potentially providing a more robust support from the international community, specifically to armed groups. And that relationship will certainly spill over into the aid community. And the last thing I would say is, you know, Ubay talked a lot about um, the regime's, the question of does the regime have a military advantage in this conflict? I think that's very arguable. Uh, I'd love to get into a discussion about that, but I think what's less debatable is the advantage the regime has in the services and salaries and governance issues. And I'll just end by saying we talk a lot about this issue of well, what would happen, we talk a lot to activists in Syria about what would happen if Syria was partitioned. And one of them said to me, everyone would move to the regime held areas of the country. Um, so what does, that, what does that mean for um, allegiances, negotiations, the outcomes, et cetera? I think there's a lot that could be said about that as well. So I'll just stop there and pass it on to Leila. Or Thank you, Nate. Uh, Leila. OK. Um, I think uh, thanks, Peter, for convening this session. And uh, Nate, I, I think it was useful um, to hear what you had to say because it really shows how complex and fluid the situation is in Syria. For purposes of this event, um, I, I'm not typically engaged in following the fight, uh, the battlefield in Syria. Um, there's a statistic that 95% of Syrians aren't carrying arms. And 
And I'm much more interested in my work in, in what's happening um, amongst the civilians with the local councils or with different civilian initiatives, um, the protection of c civilians. But for purposes of this conversation, I tried to um, look at the question of who is winning in Syria. And I was watching the, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing that was held a couple days ago um, that was on, on Syria, trying to figure out what should be US foreign policy after um, the Geneva talks in January and February. And um, Nate's colleague, uh, Dr. David Kilcullen, spoke and really in very uh, basic terms sort of laid out some statistics which I thought were useful in trying to answer this question of, of who's winning. And he said that 75% of the country is opposition held or contested, um, and that the regime is only in full control of one major city, that being Damascus. Um, he said, and this is what I, you know, I'm also aware of, that there have been significant losses by insurgents lately that have, that have caught the headlines, but there also have been significant rebel gains. In Latakia, just this past week, um, the, there was an offensive which allowed, um, for the first time, rebel control over the port city, over, over a port, uh, and which means sea access for rebels now. Um, and then also the last official border point between Syria and Turkey is now under rebel control. Of course, the question is, who, who are these actors in control? Are they forces that, that, the, that the US wants to align with, et cetera. Um, but putting that question aside, um, you know, he, he tried, David tried to um, sort of quantify the, the military balance. And he said that there are some 200,000 uh, rebel fighters or opposition fighters and 350,000 regime fighters. And, and that ratio is not a significant one that, that would weigh in favor of, of the regime. And he described the situation as one as an escalating stalemate. And Dr. Valley, Valley Nasser, who was also on the panel, uh, affirmed that, that this is the right takeaway. And it seems to me that that's the right takeaway, that you know, we, can, we can continuously look at who's in control of what and what's happening on, in, in what part of the country militarily. But ultimately, after three years, we are in a situation of stalemate, of, of concern, <coughs> is that there is a perception that the Assad regime is winning. Um, winning, perhaps, because they've entered into this chemical weapons deal um, with, with uh, the US and, and Russia and has, has their hand in that sense, winning because they are holding Damascus, winning w w for whatever reason. The, the notion is that the perception of who's winning matters, uh, matters. And so I think we have escalation, continuous fighting, continuous uh, humanitarian crisis, and a worrying perception that one side is winning. Um, and, and so that's my takeaway for, for purposes of adding to this particular debate on the war in Syria. But, but one thing that I think needs to be said is that the, the debate really overlooks the fact that whoever is winning militarily is not necessarily winning the peace. And I think that there's no clarity on what peace for Syria looks like. There's, there's really no thinking being done on what, what is the solution for this crisis. And there is a lot of preoccupation with, with the who's who, who are the bad guys, what are the bad guys doing, what is the, the regime's position. And there's a lot less focus on how do we actually get out of this quagmire. And three years later, we're still in cycling through the same um, discussion. I think that um, the Geneva talks, the model, the paradigm that underscored the, the Geneva talks, a transitional government with day after reform options via the opposition body, 
um, or getting to a transitional gov government with with transit with the day after reforms via regime and uh, itilaf direct talks doesn't make sense anymore as a paradigm for solution if it ever did. I think Syria is a failed state. Um, I think uh, from what we've heard, the government, uh, the regime, the Assad regime does not have a legitimate monopoly of power. Um, there is a rise of warlords. There are a multiplicity of armed actors. And I think, um, I think we need to start thinking about Syria as a failed state and, and, and thinking about what the, what the implications are for what kind of negotiation process we need to get out of, out of, this, of this process. And I think ultimately that process has to be Syrian-led. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it should be led by the State Department and I don't think it should be led by the Gulf. I think that third parties have an important role to play and we need to think through it. Um, it's it, counterterrorism or a policy of containment, which is what I think the U.S. is, is uh, that's its, its stance right now. I don't think that that is a, an, a position that is useful to helping us get to solutions. Um, and, and so I think we need to be reordering um, the discussion, focusing a little bit more on what's happening um, relationally between the armed groups, the different groups, the civilian actors, um, and trying to figure out how uh, those relationships that are ha happening and unfolding on the ground in Syria, including with regime actors, can be capitalized on to build up a process um, with third party in, uh, support to, to get to a more stable uh, ground, hopefully maybe a ceasefire, at least in the beginning, and then eventually uh, toward a, a process of, of uh, recovery and reconciliation. Thank you, Leila. Yep. Well, Leila, you used the phrase escalating stalemate, and um, you know, a, a kind of classic uh, uh, kind of, when you look at how civil wars end, it's a, uh, as, as Zartman put it, it's a mutual recognition of a mutually hurting stalemate, and that's sort of the. So, is there any recognition on both sides that the stalemate is just going to continue, and 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 that perhaps there should be something that uh, could be done to to end it, and and a sort of corollary of that? You mentioned third parties, and and this is perhaps directed at Ube. Um, you know, who who would be the trusted interlocutors by either side, if anyone? Well, <coughs> first on the on the issue of stalemate is. You know, we have to take in to, into mind the context that you have. A stalemate ultimately favors the insurgents. Um, yeah. A stalemate in, in such a fight as we're seeing in Syria today is really at the benefit of the revolutionary forces who simply don't have to lose. They just have to hold on. And ultimately, and ironically in many cases, the regime forces are getting get weaker the longer that they are out in the field fighting the opposition forces um, that are essentially an asymmetrical force um, in, their, in their composition and in their strategy. Um, so this is a regime, this is, this, is a for, this is a military force that was not meant to be fielded for such a prolonged period of time and to fight this type of fight. Now, that's precisely why the Iranian Quds Force came into play to provide that expertise, to provide that training in or urban warfare and guerrilla warfare. And in, many, and in um, some ways, this actually had a pretty significant impact on the dynamics on the ground. In terms of um, interlocutors, well, it's on the, on the regime side, it's, we're seeing increased dependence on both Russia um, and, and Iran. Um, an interesting piece of information that since February, since the beginning of the first round of negotiations in Geneva, we've actually seen a significant increase of Russian delivery of arms to the Assad regime. And this is important in particular because the Assad regime depends on the Russian Black Sea Fleet for, to, uh, to deliver these spare parts and refurbished aircraft that the regime then uses to drop the barrel bombs over Aleppo. And as a, as a consequence, we saw a significant spike in the use of these barrel bombs, 500 to 1,000 pound bombs that the regime is dropping all over Aleppo and in southern Syria. Now, these barrel bombs don't actually have any real military utility. 
Um, they're simply used as part of a, a, an institutionalized and systemic strategy to depopulate the liberated areas and to force um, thousands, and in the case of Aleppo, potentially upwards of hundreds of thousands of internally displaced people to leave the city into the northern countryside. So this is a regime that is still very highly dependent on, uh, a sh uh, on shifting militarily the demographics and depopulating wide swaths of the country as part of, their, as part of their campaign. And this is not a sign of strength. This is a sign of weakness. This is a sign that this is a regime that is ultimately not comfortable in its authority, that this is a sign of a regime that is ultimately not, not confident in its ability to hold territory that it does not simply obliterate, uh, totally destroy and annihilate. Well, if the, if the revolutionary forces win uh, because they're not losing, and you know from the, and also, also a question perhaps for Will and, and Nate, um, you know, the, the academic literature would suggest that somewhere between 10 and 15 years for an outcome to come about in this kind of situation. So are the rebels prepared for this kind of length of fighting? Do they understand that uh, this stalemate can go on for a very, very long time? I'll take that first. I'll take first crack at that. Um, I think the I think the I think the rebels are. Uh, I don't know if the international community is, um, and if that's something that the international community can stomach with this push for a negotiated solution. In the context of thinking about the the Dr. Zartman's theories of ripeness, yeah. I mean, if we push for a solution before there is this mutually hurting stalemate, it will not only perpetuate the violence at a low level. But it puts the international community in a very difficult position of having to say, well, what is the involvement that people would take in Syria in the post-conflict reconstruction process? How much would they cooperate with whatever the transitional government is or whatever it looks like in tamping down whatever remains of either the staunchly pro-regime if the transitional government looks more pro-rebel or staunchly pro-rebel if the transitional government looks pro-regime? To what degree is the international community's involvement in the in the reconstruction and stabilization of a post-conflict Syria make them a little bit complicit in the tamping down of such a group. I think the rebels could do it. It's just a question of well, how actually, much would they be involved in I actually in will question that. I, I mean, I, I, Dr. Zartman's theory is that a mutually hurting stalemate is something that arises typically before the conflict gets really underway. And once it's underway, the, it's hard for a party if they, to see a mutual, uh, to see a stalemate as being an opportunity to get out of the conflict. And, and both sides right now are almost, or uh, all actors are in this fight, this existential fight. And I think the regime is, is fighting to the end. And I think increasingly <laughs> the rebel fighters are also fighting, the Sunni fighters are fighting for their own survival. And so I think we may be beyond the point of a mutual hurting stalemate, br bringing the parties to the point of, of compromise. But I, I want to say something about the rebels. I mean, I, the Syrian American community brought a lot of people from Syria uh, to the Washington this past month to, to um, recognize the anniversary of the conflict. And talking to people who are inside Syria, they say that if you talk to rebel fighters and say, well, what do you want? They actually say, I want to go to school. Um, <laughs> I want to I want to I want to go work. I want a normal life. Many of the people who have taken up arms or who are leading these councils are, are not doing what they were trained to do, are not doing what works, are not doing an easy job. And so I actually don't think we can assume that that there is a staying power on the part of the opposition particularly if they're not well equipped. And the other thing I want to say is that I don't think we can talk about the regime as a monolith anymore. Um, there are paramilitary forces um, where, that have acted against government wishes in the context of the Hums ceasefire. We have heard about people saying that they've made deals with regime actors and the deal has been um, cut or interfered with by uh, Iran, the Iranian embassy. I, I mean, we, it's just, it's a very, very complex situation, but I don't think the regime anymore can come to the table as a side per se.
Was it a mistake when historians write about this period for the United States to say that Assad must go? Because you can't negotiate with somebody when you're pointing a gun at there. If there's no, if there's no sort of, where, where does that leave him? I don't, I, don't, I don't think it would have been a mistake if they had put some muscle behind it. I, I, the mistake was saying it, but not really taking the actions to make it happen. What can the United States do now, uh, realistically, um, to ameliorate any of this? Well, okay, that's, we'll, that's we'll, the, we'll take that as the answer. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the most eloquent well, answer we've. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just, you know, just, just really quick on, on that issue. Um, so the UN, just just last week, Ban Ki Moon issued a very damning report that um, uh, related to the UN Security Council resolution that was passed exactly 30 days ago, that called upon all sides to immediately open up humanitarian access and to end indiscriminate bombardment and indiscriminate killing. Now, the Ban Ki-moon report is important because it clearly uh, shows and it clearly outlines how the Assad regime is in, is in malfeasance and is in non-compliance of the, of the Security Council resolution. Uh, so now we're at a turning point where the Geneva negotiations have uh, completely stalled, if not failed, because of the Assad regime's refusal to go back to the negotiating table, and in large part because the Russians have also clearly um, indicated that they will not push the Assad regime to accept a transitional governing body um, as a basis for a negotiated solution. And we now have uh, the UN Security Council faced with a new decision on how do you now hold the regime accountable um, and how do you push the Assad regime to accept its international obligations, which it, it clearly has you know, no, no intent in, um, in following through. Um, and it's not really clear if the United States has a policy on that follow through. Mm -hmm. um, there are many steps that the United States can do to pressure the regime, one of which is increasing the capacity of the moderate free Syrian army to defend the Syrian people um, against, against these atrocities and to potentially open up humanitarian routes into the besieged areas where you have over 250,000 people that are facing starvation, uh, a star starvation environment due to a to the regime's starvation onto submission campaign. Um, but quite frankly, more and more, it is increasingly clear that all avenues for a negotiated solution have been exhausted, and which leads us to really the only other alternative, which is for the administration, for the United States to take the lead in at least, in at least putting the Assad regime on notice that there will be punitive measures that go beyond what, what has already been uh, Put forth. But what could those possibly be without a congressional authorization for violence? I mean, a lot of it will, will, will simply, I mean, look, you know, no one is asking for boots on the ground, right. right? And no one is asking for American airplanes over Syrian airspace. Um, but you're seeing a lot of, you know, Congress, uh, dynamic in Congress telling the White House that look, the status quo is not sustainable. It's not sustainable because, A, the, the, the humanitarian situation is gone so beyond the pale that is destabilizing the entire region and it's affecting, directly affecting and impacting American national security interests. And two, the status quo is not tenable because there are real serious counterterrorism concerns um, with, the, with extremists and transnational elements that have asp you know, aspirations to attack Western interests um, and regional allied interests uh, because they're taking advantage of the vacuum that's resulting um, in, the, in the status quo. So, Really, you know, uh, you really have to increase the capacity of the opposition in the Free Syrian Army at an, expo ex at an exponential level. Um, and you have to work with the allies to, quite frankly, reconsider some of the options, um, some of the military op options that were previously taken off the table. Um, look, the... Well, so meaning what? Meaning either the... The regime will have to face military, a, a, a multilateral military action, a punitive military action, or two, um, sanctions. You know, but how, do, how does that happen, Ube? I mean, you need a UN resolution for that, and that's not going to happen. Absolutely, you're not. You're simply not going to see a UN Security Council resolution because you know because of the Russians. So you're going to either have to rely on the regime's refusal to abide by its international obligations, um, stand by the the right to protect doctrine, or you're going to have to go back to simply what the United States has been doing up to this point, which is supporting the opposition both on the governance side and on the military side, and trying to pressure the Russians to get the regime to come back to the negotiating table. Unfortunately, that track has 
also been all but exhausted. Go ahead. Um, I go back and forth on this issue, but I, I, I think under the R2P, the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, there may be a case to be made to say that there is a moral duty to protect civilians, and that may require addressing the aerial uh, ad advantage that the regime holds. Beyond that, I don't. I think any other military option becomes very messy, um, and and we can we can debate that. Can I ask but, you but can, just a press on I, that? Okay. But the but one option that we haven't heard of, and we don't typically think of this as an option in the Middle East, and that is a, a, a peacekeeping or peace enforcing uh, force on the ground, because you do have these localized ceasefires that are popping up, and they're, they're running into trouble, and the possibility of monitors on the ground could perhaps create more humanitarian space for Syrian actors to begin to address some of the complexities, some of the crisis that is happening on the ground. It's an idea. It needs to be studied. If right, the right to protect was sort of invoked, it would be a very novel um, use of it under, uh, I mean, under, under which authority would it come from? I mean, who would be the enforcer? In Kosovo, which wasn't a UN uh, operation, it was a NATO operation in Europe. I mean, who would be enforced? Who, how do you operationalize that? Well, I think you have, uh, you would have to do a, a coalition of, of the willing, if you, yeah. if you will. But it would put the United States in an awkward position, potentially, to be, uh, presumably you were saying the United States would lead this, right? Because it would be outside NATO, and it would be outside the UN. I, yes, I, I, I mean, I don't have, I haven't studied the legalities of it, but, um, or the operational aspects of it, but I, but I think that there's enough consensus out there that one of the major dangers and protection uh, problems is, is the barrel bombs and, and the aerial attacks. Here's a, here's a wild thought. What if the Arab League did it? Yeah. The Arab League took leadership. I mean, they were, in, they were there in monitors on the ground in 2012, and there was, a, there was a qualitative drop in the number of people killed while they were there in country. Um, so well, the Arab League has sort of surprised us once in the past in its 60-year history, which is Libya, right? So maybe it will surprise us again. OK, well, let's open it to questions. If you have a question, identify yourself and uh, wait for the mic. This gentleman here is. Yeah. Oh, the Aberdeen. None of you emphasize the humanitarian disaster that is taking place. I mean, we talked about the military. We talked about who controls what territory. We talked about Syria being a failed state. Sure, got it. So humanitarian. Uh, no, but my point is. Yeah. The U.S. has given the most aid in terms of humanitarian support. Now, when you look at the rich Arab states, why can't they give more aid to help those refugees in Syria? I mean, in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan. Because ultimately, the outcome is going to be determined by this humanitarian issue. Uh, I'll, I'll start with that. I mean, I think you're absolutely right in bringing the humanitarian issues to, to the fore and in highlighting in particular the challenge of refugees. I mean, as we all know, the Middle East is in a place that does refugee communities very well. And, you know, what is the chance of, uh, of an entire generation of Syrians who are cast asunder from Syria? What's the state of the rebuilding process inside Syria? And I think one of the things I want to jump off from what Obay said is not only is the regime depopulating areas in a lot of places, but it's also uh, going after a lot of the key infrastructure that uh, Syrians rely on for their daily existence. And I would encourage for whoever is working on this particularly to determine whether this is deliberate targeting, but it's certainly no coincidence that in Deir Azur, for example, there are four water treatment plants. One is under regime control. The other three under opposition control are all destroyed. Uh, in Dara, um, bakeries are constantly bombed. In Aleppo, they've been constantly bombed. People have to shuttle bread b back and forth. And so when you think about what that means in the context of the refugee issue, you're talking about a huge number of people who are displaced, who are sent outside, who are leaving Syria, and who would be going back to places that have not only been decimated, 
but whose key infrastructure has become so so uh, destroyed that there'd be no interest in them returning at all. So you're thinking about not just saying, how do we make the lives of refugees uh, uh, tolerable in the countries around the Syria, but how do you figure out what are the drivers of people that would bring them back to their homes, and how do you engage that issue in a multifaceted way? I also don't think the Gulf countries have been too bad. I mean, they have given a lot of money at the UN conferences in January 2013, this past January. They've pledged a lot. A number of those countries have actually followed through. So I, I, I don't think they've been absent on the humanitarian front. Just a real quick note on that. Look, the humanitarian situation is, like I said, beyond the pale. But it's a, <clears throat> it's a hemorrhaging wound. And a, a policy to sort of cauterize it and to contain it is simply not working. And it's simply not, not, a, not a viable strategy. You have to go back to the root causes, like, like you know, Nathan implied. The fact of the matter is, it's, you're going to have this outflow of refugees is not going to decrease anytime soon. Um, the displacement is not going to stop anytime soon if you don't deal with the issue that is driving it, the, the, the engine in the first place, much, much of which is, is this systemic military strategy by the Assad regime to displace populations and to use mass and indiscriminate um, artillery bombardment. And real, real quick on the food distribution issue, just last, uh, last week, and Reuters had a very interesting article on the first delivery, cross-border delivery uh, of, the, of the UN World Food Program coming from Turkey into Hasaka province into Kamishli, a, um, a majority Kurdish area that still has some elements of, uh, of regime control. And when, when locals were asked about this delivery and, and its significance, one of them replied, well, it's useless because it goes to regime distribution centers. And ultimately, the regime has control on who is fed and who is not. And we have severe problems with this issue in Damascus. So there are some real important questions that need to be asked in terms of you know, billions of dollars of, of, of US money and Western funds going to these relief organizations that are not used to feed into, uh, peop, you know, need, those that need it the most, and that are not used to provide medicine to those who are sick, but ultimately are used as a, as a tool, as a weapon by the Assad regime. Gentleman here. Yeah, just here. Where are these hundreds of millions of dollars of private money coming from? Can you identify yourself as well? Just Can you identify yourself? Uh, Mark Brodsky, uh, retired. Where are these hundreds of millions of dollars of private money coming from? Yeah, these are, these are either Syrian expats that are living in the Gulf or, or Gulfy citizens themselves. I mean, they're, they're donating the money. There's a few prominent bundlers, uh, particularly who live in Kuwait, that solicit money primarily over Twitter. Um, and it's very easy to, to route the money there. And uh, they will report on the donations they've gotten from uh, around the Gulf. And then that money ends up in the hands of the militias in Syria. Um, and at least early on, the, the brigades in Syria, the rebel brigades, were very upfront about sending, uh, receiving the money, uh, who sent it to them. Sometimes they would rename their brigades after the bundler who had sent it so they could attract more. And that's one reason, incidentally, that there are a lot of YouTube videos uh, from these uh, militias, particularly the Salafi ones, because they're designed to generate uh, money, uh, bring in this revenue from the Gulf. Yeah, I would have just add, and Will's being modest, but he should be bragging about a great report that uh, Brookings put out earlier this year with Elizabeth Dickinson on the flow of foreign funding into Syria, to particularly to militant groups. It's a great report, so I would encourage you to read it. But on the council side, there's a similar situation. There's less of this sort of bundling and processing. There's less money and attention being paid to the community organizing groups. But uh, Syrian expats in the Gulf are a huge source of donations. And I think when you think about what that means with regards to the organization of a governance body in the opposition, it means chaos because you're talking about people plugging in at every level of the governing structure. So people are donating to a town or people are donating, you know, Qatar will give $8 million to the Etilaf to give to local councils as sort of a one-off thing. And so these councils get money themselves, they get money from the provincial council, so everyone's trying to raise money on YouTube and Facebook, etc. And it makes for a very, very chaotic situation as contrasted to the regime side where they get the millions of dollars in, in loans from Iran or in Russia, and it trickles down. And I think but that's if a big Just a clarification, so if you want to donate, uh, how do you actually do that? I and mean, who do you, how does the money get transferred? 
Um, it's, uh, it, I, it, it, it happens, I mean, usually there's a number that's put up for WhatsApp, and then they provide you with the details for how to get the money to Kuwait, and then the money is wired usually over to some town in Turkey, and somebody goes across the border with a suitcase full of dollars. Also, illicit oil sales, it's critical to focus on this issue. You had the majority of the oil wells in eastern Syria and Deir Azor and parts of Hasaka had been either captured by al Nusra or the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Um, and increasingly, you're seeing these, you know, the, um, these oil fields um, and, you know, and, and very crude um, sort of extraction uh, facilities being, being uh, implemented, being you know, set up by, by these extremists. And who's the oil sold to, in many cases, is to the Assad regime. Because the Assad regime still controls the two refineries uh, that Syria has. They're in uh, one in Homs and one in one Tartus. So you have this interesting <coughs> dynamic where knowingly the Assad regime is working closely with some elements of either, whether it's uh, al Nusra or the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant and Deir Azor to sell, uh, you know, sell, to both extract and sell oil for, for financial benefit and for the Assad regime. They use the, the crude oil or the refined fuel for, uh, for diesel and uh, to, to uh, fuel its uh, war machine. So you have this interesting dynamic both on the financial side and on and some may argue tactical cooperation between the extremists and the Assad regime. Gentleman mm -hmm. over here. I'm a, yep. Brian Fishman. Hi, uh, Brian Fishman with the New America Foundation. I have two questions. Uh, one is, we know that the United States has many interests in Syria. Um, if you had to name the single most important that we should optimize policy around, what would it be? Counterterrorism, eliminating Assad, the humanitarian situation, containing regional instability. We can't have it all, so what's number one? And the second is, what do you think the implications of an ISIS or a Nusra, um, either sourced or uh, either of those organizations providing safe haven for an organization that conducted a terrorist attack in Europe, what would the implications of that be? So I'll, I'll take a stab at both. Um, I think the priority should be bringing the rebels uh, together under a single unified command structure because I think it has major implications for everything else that we've talked about, for counterterrorism, uh, for uh, the aid and for governance, and for bringing Assad seriously to the table because right now he, the perception is not just in the press that he's winning, he believes that he's winning. And he won't change his mind until there is a credible unified threat against him. Uh, so I think that has to be the priority. Um, the implications of a uh, plot uh, being launched against the United States or Europe uh, from ISIS or Nusra-held territory um, <coughs> would be uh, pretty, pretty grave. And I think it's, it's one reason you've started to hear noises in the press uh, about Al-Qaeda operatives from Pakistan, Afghanistan moving into the area. Um, I, I think we are gearing up for a major uh, CT push. I don't know if it involves drones. Perhaps it's just used to justify uh, giving more serious weapons uh, to the opposition. Uh, but but, I, but I, I think one way or the other, the, the United States will have to change its calculation. It is either going to have to double down on the opposition or it's going to have to start cutting a deal with Assad. Either way, but the CT uh, very much is a, I mean, as Ambassador Patterson said it a few days ago, it is the top priority for the United States. And if that's the case, it's going to have a big impact on its policy. Gentlemen here. Thank you. I'm Blake Selzer with CARE. I had a quick follow up to um, both Ube and um, Nathaniel to talk about um, the need for. Um, in during this escalated stalemate that there's no one to enforce agreements and specifically mentioning the UN Security Council Resolution 2039, which you mentioned was presented to Ban Ki-moon this week officially, showing that there has not been progress made. But Russia did support that resolution and you said that there is no chance at any Security Council resolution moving forward. My question is, do you think we shouldn't be pressing Russia? Do you think there's a chance? I mean, this is a first 30-day report and then there's another 30-day report. So just wanted to get anyone on the panel's thoughts on pushing the Security Council, ra recognizing the challenges with Russia. Absolutely. So just, just real quick on that, you know, look, in order to really gain um, Assad regime true compliance to the Security Council resolution and to gain Assad regime compliance to negotiate, to negotiate a political solution writ large, uh, 
which the Security Council resolution also um, also holds the regime uh, uh, to, to adhere to. You really have to shift their calculus on the battlefield. Uh, and this was mentioned extensively, actually, in the Center for Foreign Relations Committee hearing the other day. Now, on the, on the issue of, well, you know, the Russians supported the resolution. Absolutely they did. But what was interesting, the Russians supported it because there was no Chapter 7, there was no enforcement clause. Um, so we can go back mm. into another 30-day report and another 30-day report, and we'll end up exactly where we began, if not worse, with the humanitarian crisis going even exponentially out of control and with the region even further destabilized and with uh, even additional space being afforded to, the extreme, uh, to extremists on the ground. Um, so uh, without enforcement and without that credible threat, you, you're simply not going to have any realistic, any realistic scenario with the Assad regime adheres to that Security Council resolution or adheres to its obligations to go back to the, uh, to the negotiating table. Yeah, Brian Fishman, who's here, was um, part of the team that released the Sinjar documents, which were critical in reducing the foreign fighter flow. And you were in Iraq when that, when that happened. And Del Daly and Hank Crumpton and others went to all the relevant countries. And really, that, that was important to get the violence to come down because of they were providing the bulk of the suicide ta attackers. Is there anything analogous in Syria that could be done? Obviously, Will mentioned the Saudis have you know, kind of criminalized going to Syria now, which is, I think, important. But what else? Well, I mean, there's, there's actually some striking analogies and similarities. Uh, there's a reason why, why al-Qaeda in Iraq's uh, successor, uh, you know, Nusra, and eventually the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, are absolutely obsessed with moderate you know, Sunni, um, majority Sunni groups like the Syrian Revolutionaries Front. They're now actively fighting them. The, the jihadists refer to them as the Sahwat, the awakening groups. And the reason why they refer to them, because they, they see this plot, um, which is their worst nightmare, of locals rising up as part of a uh, popular mobilized movement against the dictate of the Islamic State. Uh, this is exactly what happened in Iraq, um, where, when American military forces were there. Um, in, in some, and, with, you know, and in some cases, well, in many cases, uh, fueled and, and supported by the United States, where you had both the both tribes, both the major tribes, uh, the Sunni Arab tribes in Iraq, and uh, some Sunni nationalist insurgent groups flip and turn against Al Qaeda in Iraq, which uh, led to Al Qaeda in Iraq losing significant ground, and just just as importantly as, as losing ground, uh, the establish the attempt to establish the Islamic State of Iraq completely failed because it was rejected by. Uh, by the local populace, and the locals were pr uh, given the necessary tools to fight back against Al Qaeda in Iraq. So, hence the obsession in Syria today. Those are fresh memories from what happened in Iraq. And their biggest fear in Syria are not American drones or American F 16s, it's Syrian fighters and the Syrian community rising up against, um, against Al Qaeda's grand vision of a, of a transnational caliphate um, as opposed to a a, a Syrian state. And that's exactly what's happening today. That's exactly why the jihadists have even publicly stated that the reason why they're in Syria is not to fight Assad, but to establish an Islamic state. And that is why they're prioritizing in Aleppo and in eastern Syria fighting groups like the Syrian Revolutionaries Front and the Free Syrian Army and not the Assad regime. I, I just, I'm sorry, I have to say that it just doesn't make sense to keep flowing money and arms into Syria. Given, given the context, um, I don't, I, I mean, I, I, it just seems to me to be part of the problem rather than the solution. And that the U.S. is falling back on this as the alternative to containment, I think shows that they, they still have no policy and they still aren't interested in saving Syrian lives. And I think that until we get that as our primary starting point, I really don't see um, how we can build out a, a real uh, s solution to, to this conflict. Well, meaning if the U.S. stopped uh, arming the moderate opposition, that that somehow would be a good thing? There is no moderate opposition. I mean, there's no way we can say what is a moderate opposition in Syria. Well, let's do the thought experiment where we stopped any kind of aid to the United States. I mean, would that make any difference to the conflict, given the hundreds of millions of dollars you've just referred to that is coming in? I mean, I, I, mean, I think that the U.S. needs to, to strike up a very uh, deliberate diplomatic uh, campaign to end this, re to end the, this uh, un unbridled resource uh, 
drive that's going on in Syria. I think that that's a, a positive contribution that the U.S. could make. I think the U.S. has tried and failed on that front. What the United States hasn't done is gotten serious about resourcing the rebels. And until you have a real pipeline of arms and money that's coming through, you are not going to pull these groups together. And this conflict will continue to fester and continue to drag in all the bad actors yeah. in the region. But well, respectfully, I mean, to what end? I mean, are you expecting that the money and arms will go in to let the rebels win? Are we expecting it to be such that it puts pressure on the regime enough to actually come to the table That's with right. serious That's negotiations? That's exactly right. So I think the skepticism that I have is from the U.S. policy perspective. I think they're trying to do two things at once. They're both trying to be the broker of the negotiations and at the same time the representative of one side of those mm. negotiations. So it's trying to do two things and it's doing neither of them well. And this isn't like, this isn't new for the United States and the Middle East either. There's a, there's a conflict nearby that is trying to do the same thing. And so I think if the goal is to, I mean, and I agree, if the goal is to arm these groups such that you can get to a negotiated outcome so that we can have this mutually hurting stalemate based on pressure from both sides, I mean, if that's the strategy, I think it's, I think it's a wise one. I just don't know if there is the understanding of the, of the process that it takes to get to those points. At the same time as we all say, the negotiated solution is the only way to go, how do you hold that at the same time as saying, the money and arms we're funding to these groups to support them is going to get to the negotiated solution? I haven't seen anyone make those connections in, in US policy circles or make any well, statements. Let, let's also be before. clear, the United States has not decided to fully resource and fund the rebels. They've made plenty of noises about it, but that has not happened. So this, these are not parallel processes that are happening. The United States is still very much in containment mode. Is the de facto position of the United States the retention of Assad then? Uh, it, with its current policy? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This lady over here. Hi. Maria Saab. I work here at NAF. Um, my question is whether um, the U.S. has lost an opportunity to collaborate with Russia to a help the Syria problem given the recent events in Ukraine, and if that creates prolonged, um, I don't want to use stalemate in this context because we've been using it in other ways, but stalemate for possible negotiations from you know top-level countries affiliated with the conflict. Um, can the U.S. be pushing aid to neighboring countries like Lebanon and Jordan and Turkey that have really been dealing with you know, the humani humanitarian crisis and are also at risk of major security problems. Okay, hold, hold that for a second because we've got eight minutes left, so I want to gather up some other questions. And this gentleman right at the back and then the gentleman in front of him. Uh, hi, Emil Baroudi. I'm with Al Mayadeen TV. Um, you spoke about the USA probably getting to a point where it should double, on, double down on the uh, opposition or talk to Assad. When would that happen? What would be the trigger for, for the U.S. to make this choice? Mm. Okay, the gentleman in front of him. Peter Kiritsu, State Department. Um, this is more from a personal capacity. Um, what, are the, what do you think about the prospects of an election? Um, now this Assad regime has been pushing forward with the bombardment campaign and the small local s ceasefires to try and put out a perception that elections are quite possible. That's not a question on legitimacy of the elections, but more on the feasibility of those elections. Okay. This gentleman here. Can you wait for the microphone? Jack reading glass. Yep. Yes. My question is, uh, of course, we're all familiar with the events in Iran, uh, the ascension of a relatively moderate uh, uh, Hassan Rouhani, and of course the people around him. Do you think there's any possibility that with the right methods we can get a change in policy and a more cooperative attitude by the Iranian government? Good question. And one final question over here. Thank you, Peter. I'm Will Ember from DynCorp International. If I could ask Ubay to go back to the to the military balance. Back before Hezbollah came in, in sort of in mass, there were reports that the opposition was getting pretty good at blowing up tanks with IEDs, uh, that uh, the, the Air Force was not working so well. They were wearing out, running out of parts. They couldn't maintain them. And they were sh shooting down or destroying some aircraft uh, 
uh, you know, it's been a year and a half since then, and they're still flying. What's going, what's going on with the, sort of the, the, that level of armament? Yeah, um, just to, you know, um, <clears throat> when it comes to the regime's order of battle, um, like, like I said before, they're only using a small percentage of their overall military in the first place. And absolutely, you're absolutely right. In 2012, the regime really faced a situation where they were losing. And more importantly, there was a recognition by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Quds Force and by their auxiliaries in Lebanese Hezbollah that without a significant infusion of support, the Assad regime would collapse. So it's interesting to see their strategic calculus. They saw an ally that was losing and potentially on the brink of collapse. And their decision wasn't to abandon them, or th their decision wasn't to potentially strike a grand bargain with the opposition, but to empower him and to, and to fuel his, his war machine. Now, when it comes to, yeah, they have their, their Assad regime's air force has faced significant attrition. And they, ha many, they have lost, actually, a not insignificant amount of aircraft, both fixed wing and, and hel helicopters, due to uh, ground fire and, and very limited use of captured um, ground-to-air uh, aircraft missiles. But they have been able to make up for those losses because of the Russian, specifically because of the Russian-provided refurbished aircraft. Um, so that's, that's really critical to keep in mind. All things remaining equal, this, the regime's military force, forces and its order of battle would have been severely, uh, faced severe losses um, on the ground if it wasn't for Iran and Russia and Lebanese Hezbollah. Okay, well, so they, is there any chance of an opening with kind of Iran now that there is a thawing of U.S.-Iranian relations? Well, Lakhdar Brahimi was just in Iran. Nothing came out of it. And it's important to um, keep in mind, Rahani does not have the Syrian portfolio. That portfolio lies directly in the hands of Major General uh, uh, Soleimani, uh, the, the commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, Quds Force, basically the, the commander of the external special operations arm of the, of the Iranian regime. And like I said before, he, their decision wasn't to strike a deal when they saw Assad on the brink of collapse in 2012, but to double down. And we've seen them even double down even more in the past year, moving actual senior commanders of Quds Force, some of whom have actually been killed, really highly trained and highly valuable operatives. And we haven't seen this happen since 2006 when they did this in Iraq, when they brought, brought in in mass uh, both ground, you know, uh, special forces units from the Quds Force and, and advisors to help uh, Shia extremist militias there. Mm. Question uh, on the elections? Uh, We're running out of time, so let's try and get to these questions. Question on the elections? Uh, yeah, I mean, we study elections a lot in Syria, and um, there's just no way to make them legitimate, even at the local community level. And they will be held, though, in July? Uh, so far as we know, I mean, yeah, I think the policy would be to just... And what kind of percentage are we anticipating Assad will get? 99%. Um, 99.7. Okay, good. Right. Why would you uh, have elections if you didn't know you were going to win? What about the, uh, the inflection point question for the U.S. in terms of, is there a point where the U.S. will actually do what Will is suggesting? Yeah, or, or, or not. It'll yeah. be in, 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 in January 2017 when the new president takes an oath, oath of office. That's when the inflection point will be. There's not going to be a change in policy uh, under the current administration. I think the best we can hope for is a change of policy on the margins. Um, the president's trip, President Obama's trip to Saudi Arabia is a very important one where Syria is, is a main topic of discussion. There's certain things on the margins that you can do, such as increasing the type of quality uh, increasing the quality of military aid that the uh, opposition forces have on the ground. Uh, president Ahmad al-Jarba, the, the president of the Syrian Opposition Coalition, gave a speech on this in the Arab League just last week, where he specifically said that, look, if we don't have the, the necessary resources to defend ourselves, then simply there, 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 is, there is no discussion of a political solution. There's no discussion of resolving the, the humanitarian crisis without ensuring that the Syrian people have the right tools. Question on aid. Anybody? I mean, well, w I didn't even hear the question. It was, was it I think, the Mayadeen yeah, TV, right? My, yeah, maybe that there might be uh, aid that we could give to some of the regional countries that it would be helpful in some way. Yeah, but I think, like I said, it doesn't address the core problem. Um, final sort of closing thoughts. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think that. Uh, I think that there's just another conversation that we can be having about Syria that, that we're not, um, which is to look at what's happening on the ground. I think that we, we can't wait until 2017 um, for a new policy. There will be no Syria left by then. 
um, time is important. And so we need to think about ways to de-escalate violence and to give Syrians space to, to dialogue and to, to reconstruct um, sp localized spaces and, and reconstruct a, a, a social and, and ultimately national contract. And we need, to be, we need to be talking about that as well as, um, as, well as the military balance. Um, I mean, you heard a lot from Obey and Will about the need to support the opposition, and Will mentioned the uh, idea of supporting the opposition towards a more advantageous position at the negotiating table. And I think that sounds like a really good idea in theory, and I agree with it in theory. I just am deeply skeptical of this administration's ability to maintain relationships. I mean, we don't do relationships well in the Middle East, let's be honest. And we can't keep relationships with these armed groups that may be moderate today, but I don't think we have the ability, practically speaking, to maintain leverage over those groups such that they don't become something else tomorrow and we don't see this whole endeavor as a sunk cost. So given that skepticism, and I think the, the administration has a very deep skepticism of that, which ends up putting it in this vicious cycle of cynicism where we don't think we can change the events on the ground because we can't build relationships. So this little amount that we do turns out doesn't change the events on the ground, so we're back to square one. So that's a problem there, but I think Given that that exists, and I also share that skepticism that it's possible, I think the United States need to think more creatively about, instead of supporting one side with guns and money, thinking about what are the spaces in the middle where there's enforcement of agreements that they can stand with regards to the regime's barrel bombing of humanitarian conditions. I think you're looking at something a little bit more like Bosnia, where you say, OK, you hit bread lines in Aleppo, we will strike another target somewhere else. I think, I think something like that is probably going to yield more positive outcomes than thinking that more guns and money to the moderate opposition is going to really fundamentally change the dynamic on the ground. Look, if the rebels continue to remain disunited, you can't do any of these things. I'm not talking about army moderates. I'm talking about bringing the whole thing together. You can't do that without serious U.S. involvement. You cannot do that without the U.S. bringing Qatar and Saudi Arabia together. And you cannot do that without cutting off the private money that's flowing in from the Gulf. On that latter issue, the administration has thrown up its hands for the last two years until folks on the outside uh, started making noise about it. And they've all of a sudden decided it's something doable. And now you see Kuwait making noises that it may be able to do something. This stuff is not impossible. It, it just takes identifying the problem and being willing to put your shoulder behind it. And so far, the administration has not on a number of these issues. Look, I mean, difficult is not impossible. Syria is not intractable. It's not a sectarian black hole. And that we're seeing and a, a real strong argument can be made increasingly today that you're seeing a convergence of American national security interests with both supporting the opposition and with taking real concrete steps that would stem, if not neutralize, the, the root causes of this humanitarian disaster. That is a convergence of America's moral, moral interest and the moral imperative and the strategic interest to ensure that a failed Syrian state doesn't become a magnet for international terrorism, doesn't become the new North Waziristan on the Mediterranean. It can be done by supporting groups like the Syrian Revolutionaries Front which the United States has become increasingly comfortable with, increasingly proximate with, in terms of the fact that the, United, you know, the American government has been working with the opposition now for well over two years. Washington knows who they are. They know the true nature of the moderate opposition. They know, they know what their agenda is, where they are, their, you know, their whole family story. So this notion that, well, we don't know who they are, we don't really know who to work with, is, is, is really is not, is not the case anymore. So, if anything, the United States can double down. It has options on the ground in working with the moderate elements of the opposition. And it can do so in a way that can both at least neutralize the Assad regime's capacity to expand um, atrocities on the ground while strengthening the ability of the moderates to establish local governance to, and to establish security to prevent extremists from taking over. I want to thank Leila in particular for helping to organize this and, and Nate and Will and Ube for presenting and that was a master class in Syria. Unfortunately it left us um, kind of where the Obama administration is which is it's difficult to know what to do. Uh, but thank you for all coming. <laughs>